Why is satire more important than ever in our current culture? What is it like to be raised in a fundamentalist quasi cult and then to become a born again believer? We're talking about all of this and more with the Babylon Bees, Joel Berry. We will end the conversation with a rousing game of Would You Rather. You know how much I love that. You guys are going to enjoy this conversation. It is deep, but it's also really fun. You'll laugh, you'll cry, all that good stuff. The episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Allie. That's GoodRanchers.com slash Allie. Joel, thanks so much for joining us. Can you tell everyone who may not know who you are and what you do? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm the managing editor of the Babylon Bee. Been mm. working there for three years. I think I've heard of that. Last three crazy years. Yeah, have you heard of it? Um, yeah, I little, think so. But little. you know, I went to go. I went to look it up the other day because I heard of it for the first time. <laughs> I looked at the Twitter page, and they hadn't tweeted since March. So I just figured that. Like yeah. the person who ran it died, <laughs> but you're here. So what, I mean, what happened yeah, with that? Yeah, we're here. We're still still posting jokes, uh, just not on Twitter. Not on Twitter. Um, hmm. Twitter decided that we were we were too much. We were unfit for, for their platform. So I and can... what, what was the deciding joke okay, so that the, got kicked you off? Yeah, so the deciding joke, I guess the context was um, uh, Rachel Levine, who is the assistant HHS secretary, who is a transgender woman, biological man, um, had just been named uh, the Woman of the Year by USA Today. Yes. Um, and uh, we. Yes, girl. Th- that was just Go. funny by itself, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, Woman it's like of the female. Year. Of all the women out yeah. there. <laughs> it didn't even just say like transgender woman. Right. I'm pretty sure that it was the New York Times that actually said female. Okay. So it's this person amazing. who has literally sired children, uh-huh. female. All right. Yeah. Uh, incredible. And, and that's, that's where our job gets hard because. It's one of those cases where the real world is more absurd than anything we could come up with, right? So, you know, the site was a little quiet that day. It was feeling a little mischievous. So I, I wrote this joke where we decided to make Rachel Levine our man of the year. We, we awarded uh, Rachel Levine our man of the year award. And it's, you know, m- not so much of a joke as it is a kind of a mischievous, like a troll yeah. type thing, you know, yeah. we just, we threw it out there. And that's kind of what like a lot of the Babylon B jokes are. Yes. You're just presenting the absurdity of reality in a way right. that is either a little exaggerated or ironic to make a point. Yes. Yeah, we're not pure comedy and it, yeah. people get that confused that satire and comedy does overlap. You know, uh, comedy sometimes is satirical, sat- satire is sometimes comedic, but uh, satire is more to, to make a point. We have a yeah. message that, that we're trying to get across. And so, so yeah, um, we, we put that out there. I, I talked with Kyle Mann, who's the editor-in-chief of The Bee, later that morning. He said, I think you're going to get us kicked off Twitter. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> he was right. I think either that afternoon wow. or, or the next morning, we had been suspended. And, uh, you know, I, I think the initial plan was, you know, maybe we just I delete the joke like Twitter wants us to and we'll go yeah. about it. We'll turn it into another yeah. joke. You know, we'll make fun of it. Because for, for those who just don't know how the Twitter suspension process works, which they probably do because I've been suspended several times with the same <sighs> thing. Um, they typically make you, they say, okay, we will let you back on Twitter in 12 hours if you delete this tweet. So they hold you right. hostage. You yes. can't send sometimes DMs. You can't really function on Twitter at all. Right. Um, you have to do what we say and then we will let you back on. It. I have been kicked off and sometimes I've deleted the tweets, but last time it was for something like that and I actually, mm-hmm. I appealed it uh-huh. and they reversed the decision and wow. they let me back on, which is very rare. Is but brilliant. anyway, okay, so y'all decided yeah. not to do that. You decided not to delete the tweet. Yes. So, and, and that's, I mean, God bless Seth Dillon, our owner. He, he mm-hmm. within a few hours, he publicly said, we are not going to delete this tweet. Um, we, we refuse to admit that we've participated in hateful conduct. Yeah. We are speaking the truth and yeah. we're not going to back down. We're right. not going to censor ourselves and, and uh, refuse to speak the truth. So um, he took that stand and, um, <laughs> you know, at that time, Elon Musk, who uh, is a kind of a fan of the bee, he he enjoys our content from time to time. And he was in Germany opening up a new uh, Tesla factory. Uh, but then when he came back, uh, I guess when he came back to the States, he opened up Twitter and found that the bee hadn't posted. And he was kind of what's going on, found out that we were we were off of Twitter. 
and uh, uh, kind of the rest is history. You know, I, I don't yeah. know if I don't know if that is the reason he bought Twitter. I think maybe it was a contributing factor. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as we're recording this, you guys are not back on Twitter, although this is coming out a little bit after we're recording it. So just from what you know right now, yeah. as we are talking, do you think that there is a possibility that you'll get back on? Yes. Now I, that it's under new ownership. I think we will. Um, I think I think Elon right now has a, a very difficult job to try to keep the company together and to yeah. keep the, all the advertisers on board Yeah. Um, until he can get, get this $8 subscription service set up and get some revenue from there. Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I think... Um, I, I think he's very much in our corner. It just, um, he, he, I think there's a lot of gl- groundwork that has to be laid yeah. before he's, he's ready to start letting everybody back on. Well, there's a lot of people that I want back on. Obviously, yes. the Babylon Bee, just for the lulls. <laughs> I want Megan Murphy to get back on. Yeah. She was also kicked off for misgendering someone. And that yep. was a while ago. That was like 2018. Wow. So she deserves she to be one, of, one of, the of the first people to yeah. be put back on, I think. And then James Lindsay, that mm-hmm. was like one of the saddest ones. I think he called a groomer a groomer. Yes. Um, and I've tested that. Since then, I've called groomers groomers on Twitter. Good. I'm still on there. <laughs> um, I haven't seen my friends getting kicked off yeah. for rightly gendering someone who is a man as a male. Uh-huh. So that's a positive development. So I'm kind of hopeful for the bee. Do you feel responsible since you were the one who wrote the joke? You Listen, Joel, listen. You could be the savior, small s, right. of <laughs> democracy and free speech in the West, Joel, because you wrote a joke that got you suspended from the bee, which may have been the impetus to Elon Musk saying, I'm just going to buy this thing. We need to make jokes free again. And then he bought it and he, you know, says that he's a free speech absolutist. We're already seeing fact checks of the White House and they're taking down tweets that are really propaganda. Mm -hmm. I mean, here we are. This I mean, this is a big deal. It could be because you wrote a joke. Well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 weird to see kind of God working through this whole stream of events. And, and seriously, honestly, I have to give credit to Seth too, because I don't know if I would have been bold enough to take that stand publicly and say that say we're not going to delete yeah. this tweet. Yeah. You know, um, I, w- I had some anxiety about that. You know, I thought, well, we're going to lose all our audience and you know, what what's going to happen? You know, maybe we should just turn it into another joke and get back on Twitter. But um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of him. And, and uh, I, I think it's just funny. God, God works in, in strange ways. Uh, who knows what he's doing? Um, or how this is going to turn out. I mean, Elon might fail. You know, we we have a, we place a lot of hope in what he's doing now, but he's just a man. He's corruptible like anybody else. And um, you know, ultimately, we have to kind of trust God for for yeah. the future and and hope that uh, I, you know. I think it, the the powerful thing about Twitter and and a potentially uncensored Twitter is you know our message and our worldview is convincing. When people hear what we have to say, people are, are convinced. I remember the early days of YouTube before it was really, before they really kind of put their finger down on, on conservative speech. Um, I knew so many people who would fall into these rabbit holes of Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson, and they, and they would become conservatives because of what they were mm-hmm. seeing and hearing online. And so I, I think uh, the potential of getting back to that world where, yeah. where we're just free to speak. You yeah. know, in, in this this uh, arena of, of uh, discourse, yeah. I think it could be very powerful. Um, that is exactly what YouTube, Google, mm-hmm. previously Twitter, Meta, so Instagram, Facebook, try to prevent because they call it a radicalization. Yes. Because one person, someone might start following, I don't know, someone who is a little more moderate than me. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, oh, that kind of sounds good. That's interesting. That debunked my prior belief or Prager you or something like that. And then they say, oh, well, now I want to watch Ali Stuckey. And all of a sudden, (laughs) they're transphobes. You're the most radical. That's Yeah. yeah. (laughs) All of a sudden, they're transphobes and, and, you know, defending traditional marriage. That's exactly what YouTube doesn't want to happen. And I do Mm -hmm. think back to the days of like 2015 and 
that's really when I started. I started a blog. I started posting videos on Facebook. When, if something was popular, like if something was interesting to people, enough people wanted to hear it, it very quickly went viral. Yeah. That, I I can't even imagine something like that happening on Facebook nowadays. Never again. That just doesn't really happen. It's such a different landscape. And I didn't, you don't realize it at the time, but that was like the wild, wild west of the internet and it was great. It was, I I think there was almost an entire generation uh, of people who became conservative in that time. And and the Babylon Bee is another example. We got in thankfully before, back when things could still go viral. I'm, uh, it's hard to believe we were only started in early 2016, I think. Um, It seems like we've been around so much longer than that, but um, the, you know, it used to be you could post something and within minutes you're getting, you know, 5,000 shares, 10,000 shares. And now our, our engagement's much lower than that. And, and yeah. um, thankfully our, our audience has stuck with us through that. But um, yeah, you know, I've noticed that too, just like on Instagram, I just, and this might bore people, but we're just looking <laughs> at kind of like the landscape of how the internet has changed and how it really does impact shaping the culture. It impacts an entire generation yes. and really how people think. And like I look at my audience on Instagram that has grown by over 300,000 over the past two years and yet engagement, Mm -hmm. and it's not just me, I see this on other people's posts too, and it's not even just conservatives. Engagement has stayed the same. Like that's a problem. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So anyway, it's interesting how y'all have combated that though because you've also gotten a platform on Fox News. I have people come up to me all the time and say how much they love the Babylon Bee. (laughs) I I used to write articles for the Babylon Bee and that was super fun. So what do you think is like has created the appetite for satire that you guys still amidst censorship, whatever, have been able to grow so much? Like what button do you think that y'all pressed? Yeah, well, I, I think that, first of all, I remember when I first discovered the Babylon Bee, just as a, as a fan, I started myself as a fan, um, suddenly finding comedy that that understood the Christian world and didn't hate Christians, you know, could poke fun at Christians and, and people that I loved in a good-natured way was was very refreshing, and I think a lot of people latched onto that. Um, but then, you know, shortly after the Bee uh, was founded, uh, Trump was elected in 2016. So there was this huge, there was just this incredible cultural um, event. Um, and and I think a lot of the comedians, a lot of people in pop culture, um, they, they were so uh, horrified by Trump being elected um, that they they really felt that their duty as entertainers uh, to be funny and to make people laugh uh, had to take a back burner to what they saw as, you know, saving democracy and getting Trump out of office. So a lot of these uh, these entertainers, they weren't funny anymore. And not only that, but kind of this woke culture that was rising at the same time, um, there there became a lot of things that you just couldn't joke about. So I think a lot of the Babylon Bee's success in those early years, we were just joking about things that people weren't allowed. No one else was, it was low hanging fruit, really. We're not professional comedians. You know, I, I used to be in sales, you know, I'm just a regular guy. A lot of us yeah. are regular people. And we were writing jokes that, that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Um, kind of saying the things that everyone else is thinking, but is afraid to say out loud. And we were just throwing it out there. Um, and so that was kind of our superpower early on. Um, I think that we're seeing a, a, a pretty encouraging shift, though, in comedy. Even some, you know, some of the great comedians we see Dave Chappelle and Bill Maher, who um, who are pushing back against this this wokeness that has really kind of suppressed a lot of comedy. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, we're kind of ushering in a, a new era there. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I mean, once you make fun of something, you give other people permission yeah. to not just make fun of it, but actually think about it. I mean, that's why I I mean, I don't do satire videos all that often. There's a lot of serious things that I like to talk about seriously. But there are some things that I can't as accurately and as compellingly, if I can make up a word, talk about literally um that I, I I can do that when I do it satirically or ironically yeah. or even just sarcastically. Like it's another form of communication that sometimes I think is more effective than just explaining things to people. Yes. Like I, I mean, I say all the time that, you know, progressivism dominates all the institutions that we have. But when you say it in an ironic way, as someone who is a liberal saying, <laughs> even though we dominate 
the NIH, the WHO, academia, and public school, but even after all of that, we're still the underdog. <laughs> like, that is really what they think, though. That's yes. literally what they think. Yes. I'm not even exaggerating, yes. but kind of when you put it in that ironic way, it makes people think, oh, yeah, that kind of is absurd. Yes. So I think that's like the effectiveness that the Babylon Bee has. Absolutely. And, and I think our side traditionally has never been very good at that. I think conservatives have earned this reputation over decades as be, we're the people that point to the charts and the graphs and the say, duddies. we can't, we can't afford this and this budget and that budget. Yeah. And, and, um, and so I, now conservatives and Christians too are, are kind of the cultural outsiders. Um, America doesn't have kind of this Christian cultural consensus anymore. Um, and so we, we are kind of pushing back against uh, the kind of the completely uniform worldview of every politician, every corporation, every, everybody you see on TV. Uh, and that's, that's a really fun place to be. It's, it's kind yeah. of fun to be, uh, it, it's fun to be rebellious, yeah. you know, in a good way. Yeah, I think so too. Um, tell me how you got to the Babylon Bee. You've been there for three years. Yeah. Wow, it's changed so much. Yes. Um, and grown so much, but you haven't always been a comedy writer, right? No. No, and I, I never saw myself as a writer or a comedy writer. Um, I still don't know if I am. I, I'm just, <laughs> I'm having a blast doing this, but um, I was in uh, I was in corporate supply chain sales for almost 10 years. Um in the Midwest, um, just just a regular guy working a you know a regular job, um, I I grew up in kind of uh, fundamentalist Christianity. Okay. Um, was can you define like what did that look like? Yeah, because that's um, such a just a pejorative that is thrown around today. It is it's basically it labels anyone who. Th- thinks that the word of God is inerrant and actually tries to stick to biblical standards on sexuality and gender, but that's not what you mean by fundamentalist. No, no, we, I, I was a, uh, probably the most stereotypical, uh, stereotype of what you might consider an American Christian fundamentalist being. So, you know, if you uh, imagine the homeschoolers, you know, women that wear jean dresses and, and have their hair up in a bun and, um, you know, uh, very sheltered, wasn't allowed to listen to certain music. We didn't have a TV in our home, um, mm. all this stuff. What is it a denomination? Like, is it Baptist? Yeah, or we were, yeah, it was fundamentalist we, we Baptist, were kind of independent fundamental Baptist, okay. you know, IFB for short, I guess. Yeah, is the pejorative. no, I've heard of that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and uh, and for a while, we uh, my parents even got involved in uh, uh, Bill Gothard, uh, who was a later kind of turned out to be a cult leader and a, and a, and a very bad guy. Wow. Um, but, uh, that was our, our homeschool curriculum that we, uh, yeah. and it, a lot of people, a lot of people in the audience aren't going to recognize Some people will recognize. No, I have because I have heard of the Duggars yeah. talk about Duggars, it yeah. and how harmful it, how harmful it was. I yeah. hadn't heard about it until recent years when I heard kind of some of the Duggar children talk yeah. about like, how really toxic yep. this curriculum and the ideology was. That's really not Christianity. It absolutely. really is a cult. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there is. There is no. I. I have no idea how I'm still a Christian. We can get into that. Into that I later, would love I guess. to. Yeah. Um, it's. Um, but um, yeah. So I, that's that was the world I came from, and um, I think that was what was refreshing when I when I read early Babylon B jokes, comedy writers who kind of got that world. Um, but I, when I was 19 years old, I kind of, I kind of had this, I was always a bit of a disrespectful, sarcastic person. I always kind of looked at my world that way too. Mm. Um, I had this sense that I had to get out and and figure out what life was and and what the world was. So I, I joined the Marine Corps Mm. without telling my parents. I came home and said, Hey, I joined the Marine Corps. I leave next month, you know, bye. bye." How many siblings uh, did you have? I was the oldest of six. Okay. Yeah. And so, and you were 19. Yep. So at that point, were they just kind of like, well, we have these other five kids to take care of. You're an adult, do what you want. Or were they really distressed? They were really distressed. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, they, they came around eventually, but um, I think I'm, I'm really thankful that I, I did what I did and I joined the military and I saw the world before I went straight from the kind of the Christian bubble into a, like a secular university. Um, I, I sometimes think that maybe if I had done that, I would have deconstructed. I, w- I would have lost my faith. But um, I kind of did things backwards. I joined the military, saw the world, had jobs for a few years, and then did college after that. 
And uh, I think my, my real coming to faith was, was overseas. I was in Fallujah from 2006 to 2007. Um, and... Uh, didn't go to church the entire year. We were patrolling every Sunday, so no church, no Christian influence, no Christian bubble. Um, but God sustained me through that year in such a um, a powerful and and tangible and real way that I, I couldn't deny God existed. I was like, wow, this is real. You know, I don't know if all this is that I grew up with. I don't know if that that's all legit, but God is real. Jesus is real, um, and that was that was kind of how I really I think came to to true faith while I was over there. Then I came back, I went to college, and I came back to the States with this incredible uh, thankfulness for America, for all of the blessings that we take for granted. Um, you know, the fact that we, uh, we would be rolling down the main dr- stretch of Fallujah, you know, craters all over the road from bombs that had gone off last week, you know, bullet holes peppering the houses. And in all that, you see kids walk into school, you know, families trying yeah. to live their lives and 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 you know you hear a explosion you know two blocks away you know and the kids just walk into school like it's nothing like it's this is like the world that they're used to so i came back thinking like how how do we have it so good here like how did all of this happen like mm. i think what what a yeah. lot of people that age don't realize is that the blessings of america didn't happen by accident yeah. and it took a long time to get here yeah man um, i think that is so true such a such a misunderstanding that all the people who think oh christianity should have nothing to do with america should have nothing to do with laws i'm like where do you think the idea of human rights came from yes. yeah. like how do you not look at other countries realize that there is no even concept of human rights slavery still happens child brides are still taken sexual exploitation of women and children on a large and legal scale Mm -hmm. happen systemically in other countries that do not have the western basis of human rights that is distinctly biblical yes like it's hard for me to even understand i guess because it's not being taught in schools anymore (laughs) it used to be even from a secular perspective that the bible was the most important piece of literature if you wanted to call it that the most important document in shaping the west i don't think that's taught anymore and i think that young people are just really ignorant to that yeah and it's you know i um i think i i really once i once i realized that um I, I became extremely passionate about protecting that. That was kind of my when I really started thinking about politics more yeah. and, and and worldview, because um, because it really is I, the Bible um, and Christianity. Um, it it shaped everything. All the underlying assumptions that we have um, about uh, you know women's rights, humans human rights, everything came from that, um, and. Uh, People, kids are not just being not taught that. I, they are they are being very intentionally yeah. uh, deprogrammed to be um, opposed to that. Yeah, and this has been a long process over over long many march. decades. Mm-hmm. Very intentional, um, and it's it's something that uh, something that definitely uh, it, we t- we hear a lot about Christian nationalism right now. Yeah, you know. And and what you hear a lot from the left or from people who oppose Christian nationalism that we're just we are we are lusting after power we want political power it's like no I want people to have rights <laughs> you know I I want uh, I I I uh, I don't know if I'd call myself a Christian nationalist because I don't even know what that means but I I my political views are what they are because I love people because I care about people and I want I want my kids and their kids to to yeah. be free you know. Um, there's this this assumption on the other side that that we on the right believe what we believe because we don't care about others. We're not empathetic. We're, yeah, we want um, control. We want control. We want power, um, and and that's not true at all. You know, we we believe what we believe because we love people, yeah. and somehow that message gets gets lost out there. I think. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more. I do want to talk more about kind of like the. Christian nationalism craziness boogeyman is what yeah. I would call it yeah. out there and and what exactly you think about that um, but I want to hear a little bit more about your story you come back to America you're so grateful for how all this happened realize it it's not accidental yes um, and I guess that made you think a little bit more about your theology and about your faith yes um, it absolutely did um, I wouldn't say that I 
deconstructed because that's another word that just who knows what it means people mean different things by it but um, I did have to kind of shed a lot of you know what I was brought up in um, you know I, I rediscovered Jesus through the Gospels just reading the Gospels hmm. um, and um, you know I I told God early on, I said, I don't know what you want me to do, um, but I want to serve you with my life. You know, I want to give my life to you, whether that's being a missionary, you know, being a pastor or whatever. He said, um, no, he will write jokes. <laughs> that came later. And here I am writing, writing jokes yeah. and making memes. But, um, uh, so me and, me and uh, a close friend of mine, uh, were involved in a church plant. Um, you know, very passionate about, you know, we're kind of, we, some people in, in the audience might be re- familiar with the young, restless, and reformed movement, where, Very where much. young yeah. Christians were rediscovering sound theology, um, yeah. but it was still kind of cool and hip, and you know, yeah, uh, it came with the advent of like the podcast, I yes, think, yes, because that's when I started. I was late high school, early college, um, around like 2010, 2011. So, like, I would say, I don't know if that's the end mm-hmm. of the young restless reform, but kind of, I mean, the, you know, the Matt Chandler yes. and I mean, a lot, a lot of more teachers than that, but I started listening to them going on mm-hmm. walks and I was in high school and college and it me just too. Me too. blew my mind. Cause yeah. I mean, I was raised Southern Baptist, not fundamentalist at all, but I just didn't really have any idea of the theology and yes. the thinking and the intellectualism that was yes. under just the altar calls, yes. you know? Oh, there's like a whole world. People actually think about Christianity. Uh-huh. You uh-huh. actually defend it. There are people who have the same doubts and the same questions that I've had, and they have an answer for them from the Bible. Yeah. And started reading C.S. Lewis and Tim mm-hmm. Keller and John Piper yep. and David Platt and even Francis Chan. I'm not saying all those people are all reformed. Those guys. I, I read all of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, right there, right there with you. There mm-hmm. are problems with that movement, of course, in retrospect. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we know like some issues with Mark Driscoll and his leadership and things like that. But I'm thankful for absolutely how it got me interested in theology. Yeah, I, I think it's funny, you know, the Bible promises us that, that God will build his church. You know, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I, I think that what we see as we kind of zoom out and look at history is God uses movements. Movements come and go, you know, the kind of the, there's been a rise and fall of the young, restless and reformed and, and movements before them. Uh, but God has used each wave um, to, to for his glory, mm-hmm. to bring in new mm-hmm. Christians, to build yes. his church. Um, and it is it, at the same time, it's tragic when you look back at all, like a lot of those people that we followed and, and loved and listened to their preaching. There's been this, I think, you know, ever since 2016, there has been this huge schism in the church where, yeah. you know, some people went drastically one way, some people went drastically the other way. Yeah. Wokeness got involved um, and, and that whole worldview around, you know, uh, you know race and and uh, yeah. you know epistemology um really messed a lot of things up and so that yeah. that affected what what ended up happening we left that church that uh, that we had been a part of planting me and my friend he we we also split we we went completely opposite directions he no longer claims to be a christian he's a progressive ex-evangelical um and I am still this, you know, whatever you want to call you, me. Did you say yeah. that he was raised fundamentalist too? Yeah, he probably is very similar yeah. to, to to me. Um, and um, it's, you know, it, it is, uh, I, I think about it often, you know, why, why did, why am I still in the faith? Why did God keep me? Um, and whereas my friend veered off, you know, yeah. that's, I think that's something to wrestle with. It's a very, it's a very difficult thing. Yeah, um, but and what I mean, what do you think the difference mm-hmm. is when you when you think about it? I mean, I know you don't have the answer, but if you were just to kind of theorize, obviously there are differences, maybe in personality and yeah. experiences, right. upbringings, maybe a little bit. But like when you look back to that formative time in your life and you kind of abandon some of the non-Christian beliefs that yeah. you were raised with that were masquerading as Christian. Yes. And then you discovered the gospel and the freedom that comes from that. Like, what 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 was if you can think back, like the shift in your thinking that apparently your friend did not have? Yeah, um, it's tough. I think um, f- when 
on paper, if you look at everything that's happened to me in my life, you know, um, I, I have the classic ex evangelical experience. You know, I've been hurt by the church. I know women who have been abused by men in the, in the church. I've, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of the mm-hmm. church, you know, um, and, uh, know a lot of people who have left, uh, for things that I've experienced myself. Um, I think, I guess at a, <laughs> at a higher level, um, that, I guess that's when I my I guess my Calvinist side comes out a little bit, yeah. <laughs> and I I'm Calvinist when it suits me. Yeah. Um, and I I just have. Oh, to... I'm sure that you and Seth get into some good discussions <laughs> about that because somehow it always comes up whenever yeah, I'm with Seth is very passionate. Seth or Minnie and yeah. Dylan. Yeah. And... and then Kyle, our editor in chief, is hardcore Calvinist, so they, yeah. they like to. Yeah. But um, I, I'm kind of a squish in the middle. I think it's kind of one of those paradoxes that our human brains can't really wrap our minds around. But um, it's one of those things where I just have to chalk it up to um, God has me and yeah. he won't let me go. I don't yeah. know why. I mean, yeah. um, I think I think um, I was very fortunate to kind of be removed from my bubble, placed in this this very dark, godless place with nothing but a Bible. Um, and, uh, you know, 12 hour guard post shifts where I'm sitting in a tower with just looking on a dead horizon and nothing else to do, but read my Bible. Um, I think that's, that's what I would challenge a lot of people to do who are struggling, you know, read the gospels, read the words of Jesus. I mean, he, um, you can't pin him down into right wing or left wing. Um, he, he goes right to the heart. He goes right to your sin and, and right to what you really need. Um, the other thing too, uh, C.S. Lewis uh, reading *Mere Christianity* was ex- Me too. Ex- incredibly transformative, Me especially too. that opening chapter where he he just starts with the moral law, yes. and and reality. And, and I what, still go yeah. back to that mm-hmm. so often. Yeah, it was um, reading that was was extremely revelatory, um, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I know a lot of people who have deconverted who read a lot of those same things too. So. Um, why? Uh, God is good. God yeah. is gracious, and I, I, that's sovereign. you cannot um, you cannot claim credit for your own salvation um, because it's God who does the work. Yeah. Um, and all I can do is just fall on my knees in thankfulness to Him and yeah. and pray for those who who are struggling and who ha- have all these questions. That, you know, the the book that we, me and Kyle wrote, the the postmodern Pilgrim's Progress, wrestles with a lot of those those things. We, we this main character that we wrote kind of goes through all of the the nastiness that you see in the church and the hypocrites and the pastors who have moral failings and things like that. And that kind of the mantra that that keeps them going is is walk forward. You know, sometimes that's really all you can do um, when people fail you, when churches hurt you, when you're reading the scripture and you don't feel like you're getting anything out of it. Sometimes all you can do is just have like this very simple childlike faith in your in your father and ho- hold his hand and walk forward with him. Yeah. Until the answers become clear. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But yeah, um, there there's really something to what Jesus said where where he talks about the the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who become like little children. You know, if you, if you hold on to your pride and you, you, um, are this person who needs to have everything answered, um, needs to, to know everything. Um, it's not going to work for you. You know, yeah. you, you have to have this, this level of, of, uh, trust and, yeah. and rest that God is good. Even if you don't know what right. he's doing all the time, you know, just like a child, obeys or you teach your child to yes. obey a parent even if they don't feel like it right because we love them and they learn to do that they don't know where we're going when we get in the car half the time mm-hmm. um and yet they do it because okay these people love me they want what's best for me and i do think that that is the faith that fuels our obedience as christians because mm-hmm. i've been this person and i have friends who have been this person who say i don't want to stop doing acts because i don't feel convicted about it yes and i've even had (laughs) friends who say who say i've journaled about it i've prayed about it i've read scripture about it Mm -hmm. and but and i don't feel convicted so it must not be that bad we've probably all been that in big or small ways Mm -hmm. at some part of our lives even as sincere christians but that is not the faith like a child that god calls us to god does not say when you feel like it Come to me. He says, take up your cross and follow me. You yes. die to yourself. You die to those feelings that desire sin. Um, and so, yeah, that that childlike faith is really hard 
when you think that you know best, and especially in an age when we are told that all of our feelings are valid and not just valid, valid, but totally legitimate yes. and worth following. Yeah, well, that is that is like the fundamental divide in our religion, our politics, our culture. Um, it is divided between people who uh, believe that we identify, we, in self-identification, we define who we are and those who say we are who God def- says we are, yeah. you know. Um, mm-hmm. And you mentioned childlike obedience there. It's, it's really true. And I've said this to a lot of people, you know, in the, in the aftermath of the p- pandemic, a lot of people lapsed in, you know, going to church, um, you know, slow going back because just, you know, the pandemic was so yeah. messy and icky and, and you know, um, go to church. God command. I don't care if you feel like it. Um, God commands you to gather with other believers. So like, okay, drag yourself there in spite of how you feel. Yeah. The feelings will come later. (laughs) The conviction will come later. Um, Sometimes you just have to start with obedience. It's clearly written in scripture. God tells us what to do. Um, Whether you feel like it or not, trust him with that and just do it. And and sometimes, uh, you know, you you can't always wait for the, the feelings to come. Yeah. I, like I said, I wasn't raised fundamentalist. I was raised Christian, which I'm very thankful for. Very thankful for the foundation that my parents gave me. Um, I went to a Christian school, kindergarten through 12th grade. So it's a private Christian school, wasn't homeschooled. But, uh, and I thought it was a great education. There are things looking back that didn't love about it, that I thought, you know, I think now could be better, maybe Uh weren't great. But I'm very thankful for learning theology from an early age and learning how to apply it to different subjects. Hmm. And I'm always shocked when I see a comment on Facebook or something uh, from someone who had my same education who says something like, oh, I just like, I'm so glad that I, you know, that I've overcome all the lies that I learned from going to a Christian school. And it's just, it's so damaging what I learned growing up. And I just, I think I'm like, okay, we had the same upbringing. I know Mm -hmm. your family. Uh, We had the same teachers and now they've deconstructed, they've become progressives. And the funny thing is, is that they always see themselves. It seems like very courageous. Yeah, <laughs> they're so courageous for no longer believing what their parents taught them and what we learned at school. So I'm like, okay, you're courageous by adopting all of the ideas and standards of morality that the vast majority of our culture does. Yeah. You're courageous for going with the mainstream. You're courageous for abandoning all of these unpopular moral and biblical positions uh-huh. and just being like everyone else who doesn't have a biblical moral compass and they see someone like me as someone who did not escape and who is still just um caught in this like delusion of christian education Mm -hmm. whereas i look at them the same way i'm like oh okay yeah you went to the northeast for college and a professor (laughs) poked you know into your belief system a little bit Mm -hmm. and you were rattled, and then you just decided that it would be easier to agree with what the vast majority of the world believes. Yeah. And they see me as trapped. I see them as trapped. Mm-hmm. They see me as someone who conformed to what I've just been taught, which I, and I see them as people who have been conformed to what they've been brainwashed to believe in yeah. a lot of ways. Um, and it is when I think about I'm like, well, what was the difference? And because these a lot of these people also they're like, you know, I vote Democrat for the poor. I'm like, dude, I knew your family. You had like three homes. Yes. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. I, I know where you I know the gated community that you were raised in. Like what? <laughs> and I just wonder, I'm like, what did happen? Same with you and your friend. Hmm. About like, okay, I guess I could have gone that direction too. I had plenty of reasons to do it. Same kind of thing. I mean, I've always been a very independent person. I could see myself uh, liking feminist ideology. I like to work. I could see myself abandoning or could have seen myself abandoning like the family commitment thing. And yet, I guess like you, it's just that God kept me. He kept me. And by his grace, he kept me through a lot of seasons where I could have let my doubt just 
take me in a direction of total apostasy. And I guess that's the difference. It's not because I'm smarter than those people. Mm -hmm. I'm not. It's not because I'm naturally better than those people. I'm not. It just has to be the grace of God. That's got to be it. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think that's a good perspective. Um, And I... I think that that when when we interact with a, a lot of those folks, and and I interact with a lot of these people on Twitter, they're very angry, very bitter. Yeah. Um, it's good to um, to keep always keep that in mind um, when you're interacting with with people who have left the church, uh, remembering that that you are only s- still where you are for the grace of God, uh, yeah. be, or because of the grace of God. You know, and I I, I do think too that um, the you know, Satan is a liar. Our culture is very compelling and deceptive, and 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 it is a, a parallel religion. You know, and I think a lot of people who who grew up in religion, um, who are very um, swept away by kind of the religious trappings, who are star Christians or star evangelicals, they kind of what I see a lot of times is they they switch sides, and they're they're still fundamentalists uh, in their own way. Yeah. Um, just for the other side, just mm-hmm. for the progressive side, they still have that same kind of religious fervor. That passion, that anger, legalistic, yep. that idea that I can't dogma. associate with with other people that yeah. disagree with me. Um, it's 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 the same thing uh, playing for a different team. Just I, yeah, know. it's the a different side of the same coin. Yeah, and so I I think um, you you know you have to you have to have this um, I don't know. Anytime you get swept up in Christians are guilty of this too. We get we get swept up by you know charismatic leaders you know a a church that seems to have it all together um you know a book you know a book will come along that like just revel every christian has to read this book we do the same thing on our side sometimes and i think you you have to um continually step back and and evaluate yourself and and ask yourself you know am i am i following men right now or am i following god um you know and, and bring yourself back to the very basics of what scripture says um, what God is clear about in his word, kind of leaving the open-handed things open-handed. Um, you, you know, even as a Christian, you still can't be like, you know, dogmatic, you know, um, be sure about what God says in his word. And beyond that, there's really, there's not really not a lot you can be sure about, you know? Yeah. Um, tell me how you came to the Babylon Bee. Yeah. So, um, I was, um, I was miserable in my job. Um, my wife uh, was tired of me being miserable all the time, I think. <laughs> and uh, she, she encouraged me to, to, to branch out. So she was a nurse. She said, um, I will, you know, I'll pull extra shifts um, at the hospital. You should, you should take a year and figure this out. Just start writing. So I, I started writing. I started a podcast. I, I wrote columns for different newspapers. Um, kind of just working out a lot of the thoughts I had about, you know, politics and Christianity, worldview, things like that. Um, and uh, then I started just kind of on the side. I started pitching ideas to the Babylon Bee. I, I also started a little website called the Petty Prophet, which was a, a Babylon Bee knockoff. I was writing my own jokes and putting them up. Um, and uh, I started pitching. They liked what I was pitching, um, and that just kind of snowballed. So I, I started writing a joke a day, a couple articles a day. Um, that turned into kind of a part-time job for them. And sooner or later, I was working full time, and Kyle yeah. called me and said, "Well, you're you're kind of full time. We should probably just hire, hire you. you." You know, that's awesome. So, I mean, it's um, it's wild. I I still I still can't believe um, I'm doing this. Um, yeah, I it is it is truly God's grace because I mm-hmm. it it is the perfect uh, marriage of you know like my passion for um, truth, you know, worldview. Um, you know politics and my kind of my natural sarcastic disrespectful you know yeah. <laughs> attitude about things it just it works yeah. out great so I, I i'm glad god led me here i also had a sarcastic disrespectful attitude growing <laughs> up and so there's like something to that i haven't worked it out yet but those of us who had that we all seem to end up yeah here yeah making fun of the things that are supposed there's to there's so much that i mean this be made it, fun of there is our culture and our world is so ridiculous. People are so ridiculous. The things that people say with so much seriousness so much and earnestness. sanctimony and mm-hmm. earnestness um, is just so funny to me. The, the corruption that we see in Washington 
while it, I mean, it's it's tragic, it's yeah. it, it's damaging, and we we wring our hands about it, but it's also hilarious. Yeah, you know, we see we see human beings dressed up in their nice suits who think they're so important, you know, conspiring yeah. together and being corrupt. And it's, you know, I, I, I think of Psalm 2 where it, it talks about the kings of the earth conspire together and yeah. talk about how they're, they're going to loose their bonds yes. and, and free their, you know, themselves of and these the chains. And the Lord them. laughs, you know, and, and we who are in Christ can laugh too. I think when we have yeah. that eternal perspective that, that uh, we belong to a kingdom that, uh, uh, is not of this world. Mm-hmm. Um, our our king will never be defeated, um, and uh, we we know who wins in the end. Yeah, um, we can still fight. We we have to speak truth. We have to do what's right in the moment for for our family and for our kids and for our country. But regardless of what happens, whether we're successful or whether we're, we're defeated, we can still have this joy and this hope that comes from from knowing um, who our real king is, who are who are uh, where our end is, and. Uh, and so I think that's where a lot of the laughter comes from the Babylon Bee, you know, yeah. even while our culture and, and our our country seems to be crumbling in front of us, um, there is something that is a little bit funny about it. You yeah. Know? I also think I laugh at the people who get angry at y'all for your jokes <laughs> because y'all have become more conservative. It, yes. it kind of yeah. did used to be more niche. Yes. More like making fun of, okay, both Joel Osteen and maybe John MacArthur or something. <laughs> and now it has kind of expanded to more like news. I mean, y'all still do that stuff, yeah. but it's more kind of like what people are talking about in the news. And it's conservative. I mean, you're mostly yes. making fun of the left because they're ridiculous. Yes. And all the people who maybe they were fans of the Babylon Bee in 2016 because you made fun of someone that they didn't like. Uh-huh. Now they crossed their arms. <laughs> so they're angry. like, you're not supposed to make fun of that. <laughs> and they laugh. They make me laugh because, yeah. as you said, sanctimony. They're so sanctimonious yes. and self-serious and... It's just funny. It makes it so much funnier. I think yeah. that there's <laughs> there's something about I think conservative humor right now that a, half of the country does not think it's funny at all, and to <laughs> us that that makes it funnier. Oh, that's <laughs> so funny. You know yeah. the, the fact checks that we got. You know the when when Snopes would fact check the Babylon Bee. Yeah. You know did did CNN really purchase an industrial sized Washington washing machine to spin the news? You know did yeah. Trump really proposed putting a space navy on the dark side of the moon. Yeah. You know, like these were actual Did fact AOC checks. Did AOC actually die trying to tie her shoes because she's so stupid? <laughs> Those Did are real that fact happen? checks. <laughs> yes. I mean, it, it almost, it, like it adds a second punchline to the joke because we put the joke out there, you know, people yeah. laugh. And then it gets this very serious, well-researched, like three-page fact check, yeah. you know, from a very serious person. And, and Oh my uh, gosh, that's so funny. It's just great. The other day I saw there's another comedian, John Christ, who did like a parody video as like a meteorologist or something like that. I, it was obviously like ridiculous. And yeah. it was like a meteorologist has like a meltdown or something. <laughs> and I guess some people thought that it was serious that a fact checking site, I think it was Snopes, had to like very seriously <laughs> say that this is a comedian. It's Thank just, God for I Snopes. mean, I do think I, we don't have time to like get into all this because I do want to do a fun segment to end us. But Like there's also, I think that that is also a product of our culture and of secular progressivism is its inability to create beauty. Yes. And within that, it's inability to have true joy outside of politics and political wins and power struggles. It's like they don't have joy in anything. Like everything is anger inducing. So they can't laugh at it. The only thing they can laugh at is when unvaccinated people die. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, and a lot of that reminds me of like the hardcore fundamentalism that I grew up with. Yes. It's just like what you were saying earlier. Yeah. Their, their worldview is, um, I mean, they've thrown out 2000 years of, of wisdom, um, and knowledge, you know, that our culture is based on. They've decided to kind of create this, their own moral, framework from scratch and it's an absolute disaster and every waking moment they spend is meant is meant to defend this this rickety scaffolding that they've created yeah. they can't laugh at it because as soon as you laugh at it it, it all comes crashing down yeah. you know and so it's like they're they're just i mean like religious fundamentalists they're yeah, very so very true. jealously and angrily and and fearfully defending their world <laughs> oh my gosh view. that's so true it's kind of like when you hear those horrible stories of in places like france um like uh people getting their head cut off for yeah. making fun of 
Allah or right. Muhammad. Right. I mean, it's not that it's not that different. It's like you make fun of their gods and their idols here. And while it may not be as physically violent, in some cases, mm-hmm. they are just as angry because you are making fun of their God. Exactly. Um, all right. I wanted to end with a fun segment, uh, with a would you rather segment. Oh, boy. It's not serious okay. at all, but you do seriously have to pick. Um, I don't know what the consequence is. If you don't, you <laughs> get kicked out of the studio and you oh, can no. never come I back. I wouldn't want that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't come up with these, but they're good. And I might come up with some more if I think of some on the spot. Okay. okay. Would you rather read Adam Schiff's book about January 6th once a month <laughs> for the rest of the year? Or no, not the rest of the year, because that's not enough time. Next year. Oh. That's your New Year's resolution. You have to read Adam Schiff's book about January 6th <laughs> every single month. <laughs> or would you rather have to eat bugs as the main ingredient of your meals, um, let's say, every day for six months? I would read Adam Schiff's book. <laughs> Every single month. I will not eat bugs. I will never eat bugs. I don't. I will starve and I will die before I eat bugs. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, probably I, by the end of the year, you could have the book memorized. My Twitter feed would then become insufferable because I'd be making fun of Adam Schiff's book with every tweet for the yeah, rest of the year. Yeah, it'd be the only thing that you can think about. Um, okay. Would you rather leave your job at the Babylon Bee to become a spokesperson for Pfizer, or? <laughs> Um. <laughs> okay. Every time something. <laughs> okay. It's I don't. Okay. I, I, right. I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand exactly. Um. Exactly what this means. Okay. I'll. I'm gonna change it a little bit. Okay. So. You have to leave your job at the Babylon Bee to be a spokesperson for Pfizer, their commercials, things like that. You might even have to like go on Don Lemon's show and just like talk (laughs) about how great Pfizer is. Or would you rather have to listen to a two hour long Bernie Sanders podcast first thing every day when you wake up at regular speed? He could be talking at regular to, speed. Oh yeah, no. he could be talking that makes about it so much worse. Pudding. He could uh, be talking about Mother Russia. Uh, no. You never know. Whatever it is. Uh, okay, I would listen to Bernie Sanders' podcast and eat the bugs instead of become a spokesperson for Pfizer. That's, wow, yeah, that, that's that is a bridge too far for me. <laughs> Every morning, Bernie Sanders, two hours. Okay, um, would you rather every time you travel, every time you get on a plane? Um, Stacey Abrams has to go with you. <laughs> I just made that one up. <laughs> she has to, from the time you leave, like your car, I don't know if you pick her up or she uh-huh, meets you uh-huh. at your house. Yeah. You go to the <laughs> airport, you get on the plane, and from the time you get here or wherever it is, Stacey Abrams is your companion. Doesn't matter, you don't have to talk to her, but... <laughs> or... Would you rather have a standing lunch date with AOC every Friday, two hours minimum? <laughs> Am I in the middle seat on the airplane? Um, it, you, I, it doesn't matter. You have to sit <laughs> next to her, though. So. Okay, so I'm thinking strategically here. I think I would go AOC. Um, not because I have a crush on her or anything. I know. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. she might think that. <laughs> I think because um, she is much more influential um, in the in the culture than Stacey Abrams is, and I would make it my goal to try to convert her mm-hmm. um, and That's make her make her a, a powerful agent for goodness and righteousness. Yes, yeah. I think about that too. Whenever someone's like. Who would you like to like have lunch with or have dinner with or be friends with on the left? I'm like AOC because I can see in her little face that she doesn't really <laughs> understand what she's saying. Well, and I like, just and think at some level, she's a she's, little help. It, at some level, she is she's motivated by good things. She just wants, you know, she wants to take care Maybe. of people. She yeah. wants to, you know, whatever. Uh, like every good liberal, you know, and, and uh, she's just ignorant. You know? Okay. Would you rather have... Um, without Seth or Kyle knowing, 
start to delegate all of your joke writing to Samantha B. <laughs> she has to come up with headlines telling, and you have to and they submit have to think them. It's from coming from me. <laughs> yes. And if they criticize them, you have to get mad. You're defensive about it because this is the best that you can. Or from now on, 10% of your income goes to the jet fuel for Kenneth Copeland's jet. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, that's hard. Oh. <laughs> that's really heavy man that's an impossible choice that's an impossible choice i know samantha b i, I tried can... i sat through like a compilation of her funniest stuff like the funniest stuff i could find to see if i could laugh it's not yeah I, you can't you can't you, all of all of late night comedy i i never watch broadcast television anymore but yeah. like when i'm in a hotel you know sometimes i'll put on whoever it is uh colbert or, and, but it and it's I, I try to be charitable watching these guys and they, they're just so, they're not so angry. No. They're so angry and not funny. Um, oh, um, I couldn't, I, I think I'd have to go Kenneth Copeland's jet. I, oh man, that's. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your livelihood would be on the line if you delegated that to Samantha B. Yes. Well, I, well, uh, yeah, I, I would, I would, I would, I would give my my ten percent to Kenneth Copeland's jet, while simultaneously praying that that God yeah. grounds the jet and and it can never take off again. I yeah, guess. <laughs> in, a, in a peaceful way, yeah. a peaceful grounding. Yeah, well, you know, our, our money all the time is going to causes that we hate. We spend money with yeah. corporations and our cell phone companies and everything yeah. else. It's it's like kind of hard to get away it. from that sometimes. Yeah, I try to. You know, <laughs> yeah. Awful. Um, okay. I got one. I'm going to, this is not what's written down, but this is a funny scenario in my head. All right. <laughs> this might be the last one. Uh, uh, I don't know. You're in a life or death situation, all right? You're a life or death situation. I don't know what it is. You're in some, like, I don't know. You're on a stranded, you're on a deserted island. You are about to get attacked, but you have 30 seconds for a one phone call to call someone and this person can rescue you. But you need to very clearly under pressure communicate to them where you are, what you're doing and what needs to be done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny to me. It might not be funny to you. Who would you put in charge of making that call? 30 seconds, your life is on the line. John Fetterman or Joe Biden? <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that coming. John, Joe Biden or John Fetterman? Oh no! <laughs> life or death? Who am I? Who am I uh, staking my life on here? Um, I, I'm gonna have to say Joe Biden. I think so too, man. Yeah, I, I think so too. He's got the resources. He's the president. He's got Marine One and Air Force One. You know, he can send the military to to rescue me from whatever yeah. is attacking me. I think if you um, also told him the exact words to say, yes, and spoken really short sentences, <laughs> yeah, and like held his face, yeah, and we're like, listen to me, and yes. you told him. I don't think Fetterman could do it. <laughs> I don't think he could do it. No, I yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would not uh, trust Fetterman. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good choice. Uh, okay, would you rather? <laughs> he's great. Okay, would you rather be uh, Dylan Mulvaney's videographer for a month? Do you know who Dylan oh, Mulvaney oh, is? Lord. So you're the one who has to hold his oh. phone while he's doing the TikToks. Oh goodness. Okay. Or would you <laughs> rather be um, run PR for Kamala Harris as your job? <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'd, I'd have to go Kamala Harris on that one. I, I, I don't know if I could do uh, the Dylan Mulvaney videos. Plus... I think that would be a great opportunity to to get some sneaky satire in with with Kamala's PR. Oh yeah, uh, you know that mm -hmm. I think that would be really fun. Mm -hmm. Some guerrilla satire. Yep. Yeah. Um. Okay. These are good. These are funny. Um. Okay. Would you rather <clears throat> PayPal takes twenty five hundred dollars from you every time you misgender someone, <laughs> or you have to send twenty five hundred dollars to the war in Ukraine every time you make fun of a liberal? 
Um, I, w- I think I would, I think I would have to go with um, twenty five hundred dollars going to Ukraine for making fun of a liberal because I, I could not, um, I could not give up uh, my right to misgender somebody whenever I want. That's mm-hmm. a, that's a fundamental God yeah. given right. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of money sent to the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, who? Let's see. Um, would you rather? I think this is the last one. I'm trying to see if I want to change it at all. Um, would you rather your eulogy be given by Jesse Smollett, <laughs> or um, would you rather have to give a eulogy? For okay, I'm trying to make this up as I go. Okay, who would you rather give your eulogy, Jesse okay. Smollett or um, John Fetterman? Just kidding, a better, better work. Uh, I think that's easy, Jesse Smollett, because he he is an actor. Yeah, and um, I think I I think that he could probably really like gin up a lot of emotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and get people's, you know, get the tears welling up just about, you know, what, how great my life was. And, and, and uh, he, there, would, there wouldn't be a dry eye, eye in the place after he just kind of manipulated everybody's emotions. He, but he might use that to <laughs> accuse you of a hate crime. That's true. You were the person who <laughs> told him forever... <laughs> in Chicago that he was in MAGA land. He was in MAGA territory. So Yeah, then it's on my Wikipedia know. forever and I'm, yeah. I'm ruined. Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, I'd have to go Jesse, I think. Okay. Yeah, take Last question. Would you rather have your mom's haircut <laughs> or <laughs> It depends or, on the time or, period. Like early 90s haircut or or haircut now. Now, now hair her hair or her arms. <laughs> <laughs> um uh uh I'd go with her hair. Yeah. Okay. I, I can deal with you have long to style hair. it the way that she does. <laughs> you can't change it. You can't cut it. Yeah, I, I think that would I think that would be okay. Uh, that would be okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. on that note, that's the end of our conversation. Okay, where can people find you? Buy your books, all that good stuff. Yes, uh, you can find me at on Twitter at Joel W Barry. Uh, thebabylonbee.com. Uh, we have a lot of extra stuff for subscribers if you support uh, what we do, which we always appreciate. Um, and then our new book is uh, The Babylon Bee Guide to Democracy. It just came out. Um, it's really fun. What got a lot of pictures. And, yeah. Uh, no matter what, no matter who it you are, even, even leftists will like it. I think get a kick out of it. So oh, definitely really? pick that Ooh, up. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>